Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you joining us today to today's program, Publishing Home and Abroad from Lippincott to Today. We're going to give everybody just another second to get into the Zoom room. Um, while you're arriving, you could go ahead and use the chat to tell us where you are Zooming in from. It is 1 p.m. here in Philadelphia, but I know we have folks joining us from many different time zones. So you can use the, uh, the chat feature to tell us where you're zooming in from. Again, it's so great to have you all coming in from Florida and from Los Angeles and all throughout the country and the world, some local folk, folks here in Philadelphia. Um, my name is Justina Barrett, and I am the Director of Education and Programs at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. A little bit about HSP, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania was founded in 1824, and we proudly serve as Philadelphia's Library of American History. Our collection contains over 21 million manuscripts, books, and graphic items. And our collection holds stories of really a broad, inclusive American history with particular emphasis on early American history, science and industry, the arts, ethnic and minority groups, and genealogical research. All right, so let's see if we want to get started with some of our housekeeping. Um, today's program is being live captioned. So if you'd like that service, just use the CC button that is at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. We are also recording today's program and we will be sending it to you in a follow-up email. So look for that. Uh, finally, we are trying to save some time at the end for your questions but you can go ahead and populate the uh, Q&A box throughout the program um, as, as ideas come to you about things you wanna ask us. So let's see if we can get started. I think we have a good number of people coming in. And again, check the chat because we have folks from all over the country. I'm seeing Georgia, I'm seeing Washington DC, I'm seeing Indianapolis. Thank you all for being here. Today, we will be exploring the history of publishing through the stories of J.B. Lippincott, a publishing company founded in 1836 here in Philadelphia. Today, Netherlands-based Walters Kluwer continues to publish medical texts, reference books, and journals under the Lippincott imprint. J.B. Lippincott and Company records from 1833 to 1988 are archived at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And today we are celebrating the completion of a year long project to preserve and process 93 boxes and 768 volumes of this company's records uh, of, and publications. This work was led by project archivist Sarah Nash under the direction of Kerry Hutto, our director of archives. However, their work would not have been possible without the generous financial support of the National Archives National Historical Publications and Records Commission, NHPRC, the Gladys Kriebel Beltmus Foundation, and Walters Kluwer. So thank you to our funders that have made this, uh, this project possible. And so we are so delighted to have a number of speakers joining us today to share about book and medical journal publishing from Lippincott through to today. First, we will hear from Lisa McAllister, who is Vice President of Professional Publishing um, with the Health Learning Research and Practice business at Walters Kluwer. She currently leads content teams for, among other things, medical education and practice guiding the content development and strategy for educational, as well as cutting edge clinical and referential content in both print and digital platforms. Prior to joining Walters Kluwer, which was then J.B. Lippincott when she joined, uh, Ms. Ms. Callister has spent five years, had, had spent five years with W.B. Saunders company. So uh, Lisa, do you wanna come off mute and just say hello? Hello, nice to be here. Great to have you, thank you. We will then be learning more about the 19th century development of the global market of Lippincott publications from Michael Winship. Uh, Michael is a professor emeritus at the University of Texas, Austin. He is a bibliographer and historian of the book. 
with special expertise in publishing and book trade history prior to 1940 in the United States. He has published extensively on American literary publishing and his research here at HSP 15 years ago was foundational in beginning to catalog and inventory the records uh, from Lippincott after they were donated to us in the early 20th century, 21st century. Uh, Michael, do you wanna come off mute and say hello? Thank you, Justina. And um, I'm very pleased to be part of this event and to celebrate the Lippincott Company and the archives as they're now available. Thanks, Michael. Looking forward to your slides and your conversation too. Then we will take a quick look at some of the visual gems that are in this Lippincott collection as we shift our focus to medical illustrations from the early 20th century. Finally, we have invited Chidibere Ibe, a medical student and a Nigerian professional medical illustrator to share his work in creating and advocating for representations of black patients and black bodies in medical illustrations. Chidi Berry is the creative director of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, AFAN, Young Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies, and creative director and chief medical illustrator of the Journal of Global Neurosurgery. Neurosurgery. As a historian, I'm tripping over all of these big medical words. He is also a medical illustrator at International Center for Genetic Diseases at the Harvard Medical School. Chidi Berry, do you want to come off mute and say hello? Hello, it's good to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We look forward to hearing more about your story and your work. So I am so excited to get started and hear what you all have to say. Again, a reminder to our audience to put questions in the chat in the Q&A as they come up. We'll be sharing some resources in the chat as well and sending some things to you in that follow up email. Let's get started. Uh, Ms. McAllister, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Justina. Um, thank you to the Pennsylvania Historical Society for the invitation to participate in today's celebration of the opening of the Lippincott Archives. As Justina said, I'm Lisa McAllister. I'm the Vice President for Professional Publishing at Walters Kluwer, um, the company which acquired J.B. Lippincott from Harper and Row. I work with the teams that acquire and develop content for the products we create and distribute to students, to residents, to trainees, and other healthcare professionals. The Lippincott history is incredibly rich, and I'm going to provide only a brief glimpse into the importance of artwork in medical education and training and tell you a bit about the Lippincott of the future. I joined J.B. Lippincott several decades ago as an acquisitions editor, and even then the Lippincott traditions and history were everywhere. Perhaps it was working with an actual Lippincott in the person of Jay Lippincott. Perhaps it was the location of the office. We were neighbors with Independence Hall and we overlooked the reputedly haunted Washington Square. Maybe it was the many framed Lippincott Monthly Magazine covers that lined the hallways. Even today, the original 1897 contract for the annals of surgery hangs in my office. But J.B. Lippincott was primarily a trade publisher and responsible for many great works, both fiction and nonfiction, including in 1861, a dictionary for universal knowledge of the people. I think we call that the internet today. Also Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, My Friend Flicka by Mary O'Hara, and To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. In addition, elementary and high school classrooms were well stocked with readers, math books, and workbooks that all carried the Lippincott imprint. From the early days of the company, Lippincott had a presence in medical publishing. One notable title published by the predecessor company, John Griggs, was the United States Dispensatory, first published in 1833. This pharmacology reference continued through 27 editions until 1980. The medicine list was expanded during the 1840s and 1850s with the publication of best-selling titles like Anatomy, Physiology, and Hygiene for Grammar Schools and Families, and the Manual of Human Microscopical Anatomy. There was a journal that was edited by Dr. Samuel Gross, 
the famous subject of the Gross Clinic painting and owner of the Gross Clinic. Lippincott published the first commercial nursing book, a handbook for nurses in 1878. Many intricate anatomical drawings were created by Herman Faber and his son, Ludwig and Urban, for use in a variety of anatomy texts, including human anatomy by George Pearsall. Um, I'm sorry, Justine, are you? Uh, I only see, can you advance my slides? Thank you. There's Washington Square and there's a Herman Faber drawing. Lippincott was known for outstanding educational quality and more than a few titles have been read and studied by multiple generations of doctors. One of these, next slide please, is Tallinn's Operative Gynecology. This was initially written by Richard J. Tallinn of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. <coughs> Sorry. Um, this textbook for trainees in gynecologic surgery was first published in 1945. The editors of succeeding editions all have ties to Johns Hopkins, and it continues as a major reference for the training of pelvic surgeons. Much of the original art was created by Max Brodel, who's shown here. He was also employed by Johns Hopkins. Brodel's carbon dress drawings remained in use until the style no longer met the needs for sharper detail and more specific labeling. Today, this information is available as print, ebook, and as online references. All of those formats include operative videos to further enhance the learning process. In the anatomical sciences, the artwork is the foundation of teaching the structures of the body. The next slide, please. Among the more famous anatomy texts is Grant's Atlas of Anatomy, authored by Dr. John C. B. Grant, which changed the way the human body was studied and understood by medical professionals. Published in 1943, this was the first of a new kind of atlas. It was the work of anatomists in Canada rather than the traditional Germans. The anatomical terms were in English, not Latin. The dissections were prepared from real cadavers and they were based on regions of the body like the head and the limbs rather than the systems, skeletal and circulatory. The artwork has evolved over the past 80 years. Interestingly, anatomical illustrations had always been created by men, but these carbon dust images were created by a team of Canadian women, Dorothy Foster Chubb and Nancy Joy, among many others. Dr. Grant's willingness to employ a team of female illustrators opened an entirely new career field for women. The first example is a carbon dust drawing, but very quickly the need for color became apparent. And so it began to be layered into the drawings to highlight structures like the nerves and the blood vessels. The second photograph that you see here is a hand colored version of the original artwork. More recently, the images were digitally scanned, separated into their various layers, remastered and recolored under the guidance of Drs. Ann Agar and Arthur Daly who continue the work of their Canadian predecessors. You can see this art is much more dramatic than the preceding versions. So what about Lippincott today? It's an amazing place to work. Our global workforce serves as the publisher for 350 journals and about 200 English language and 40 Spanish language books each year. All of the information is available in multiple digital formats and as integrated learning solutions. The subject matter, that is everything medicine, is constantly changing. And because publishers function as a form of educator, we also contend with changes in the publishing process and in technology. Lippincott must continually reinvent its workforce, its processes, and its products to meet the educational and training needs of our customers. I'm showing a few examples of what Lippincott does today. One basic product line is the anatomical charts. You may have seen one of these on the wall of a doctor's office or quite often as background in a movie or a prop. There are more than 150 charts, some in Spanish, all intended to help healthcare providers 
explain a disease or condition to their patients. The Lippincott name is widely recognized and many products still include Lippincott in the title. The Lippincott Illustrated Review Series, which is shown in the next slide, is used by quite literally hundreds of thousands of college health professions, nursing and medical students to learn the basic sciences. Other products are known for unique attributes. Cancer, the book in the center, for example, debuted in the 1970s. It was the first book in the field of unconscious print will always hold a place in our heart, but digital products now make up a larger portion of what we do. Digital versions of books are a more sustainable option for the environment. They're also way more convenient. They're portable. The information is easier to search and the integration of animations and videos and other multimedia features make learning a richer experience. Students are better able to understand a drawing when an added animation demonstrates the concept. Surgical, um, <clears throat> surgical trainees benefit greatly when a carefully drawn conceptual image is paired with a photograph from the operating theater. The next generation of products is moving even farther from the traditional textbook. Short form text integrated with multimedia and with journal references with embedded self-assessment is now the expected offering. So it's been a few hundred years and Lippincott products continue to evolve to adhere to our mission. That is to educate and train healthcare providers using expert information so that every patient has access to the best possible care. Thank you to some of my colleagues who helped with this presentation. And now we'll rewind the Lippincott story and hear from Michael Winship about a different aspect of the J.B. Lippincott history. Okay, am I on screen? You're good to go, Michael. Thank you, Justina. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today. And as I understand it, my role here is to give a brief account of the early history of the Lippincott Company and to celebrate the conservation and processing of that firm's archives. I want to acknowledge and thank Walters Kluwers, NHPRC and the Delmas Foundation for making the conservation and processing of the archives possible and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania for acting as a steward of them. I know the Lippincott firm, not as a medical publisher, but rather as a trade publisher, for that was what it was for the first 150 years of its existence, even while um, it did include some medical imprints and periodicals in its list. It is chiefly this phase of the Lippincott history that the archives document. As an academic, I've dedicated my scholarly career to the study of the history of the book publishing in the United States, especially during the industrial era uh, from say 1820 to the end of the 20th century, when the digital revolution is in the process of reimagining the methods by which books are edited, produced, distributed, not to mention the form in which we read and see them. A special interest to me has been the early years before the Civil War, when our national trade publishing system was established. Most of our major trade publishing firms, we've talked about Lippincott, but Appleton, Harper, Houghton Mifflin, uh, Little Brown, Scribner, were founded during those years and in one form or another still survive today. 
Our publishing system is characterized by the concentration of publishers in a very few East Coast cities, Philadelphia, Boston, but increasingly in New York. Meanwhile, the market for books kept growing, first as the nation expanded across the continent, but then internationally. By the 1830s, retail bookstores and other outlets for books were beginning to be established in even small towns across the American continent, and they needed to be stocked. This arrangement immediately raises the question of how those publishers on the East Coast managed to distribute books to that extensive and increasingly expanded market a problem that characterizes, and I should say still haunts, American publishing today. The answer is the rise of middlemen or jobbers, specialized firms that acted as mid intermediaries between the publishing firms and the independent retailers. Today, we still depend on such firms, think of Ingram, and Bert, ba Ingram or Baker and Taylor that perform this function, even as amazon.com and digitization disrupt this long-standing system. And this is where the early history of J.B. Lippincott comes in. For as well as being a major publisher of trade and other miscellaneous books, and you might want to start the share screen now. Uh, the firm was surely more important in the 19th century for its activities as a jobber, supplying books of all publishers to an eager market in the South and the Midwest. And here we have a picture from the 1850s of uh, first the uh, order room of Lippincott's and then below it, the shipping department. And you can see they're not sending you individual books the way Amazon does. They're sending crates to bookstores, libraries, and so on. Uh, in 1854, Henry Carey, the son of the pioneering publisher, Matthew Carey, and a former publisher himself estimated that the Lippincott firm likely was the largest distributing house in the world. Now, noting that it's often sent out in one day an average of more than 10 tons of books, an amount that Chambers and Company of Edinburgh, which was the largest distributor in Britain, boasted to have sent out in only a fortnight. By the 1860s, Lippincott was said to supply books from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from New Orleans to Newf Newfoundland. Um, much of my own research has been based, oh, let's go, yes, go to this. And here we can see uh, uh, the letterhead of a bookstore in Indianapolis, or no, in, where is it? It's, it's in Indiana. Uh, that, uh, and you can see here, Western dealers supplied with publications, Lippincott, Brank, and quantities at Philadelphia prices. And I just throw that in there as a signal of, uh, you know, how important Lippincott was in the book jobbing business. But yes, much of my own research has been based on working with the archives of major trade publishing firms. Houghton Mifflin and Little Brown at Harvard, Harper at Columbia and the Morgan and uh, Scribner in Princeton. But for many years, it was widely agreed that no substantial survival records from Lippincott Company existed. Whatever had once been, had been destroyed in a devastating fire at the firm in 1899. 
This understanding was confirmed to me by both Jim Green of the library company and uh, Stuart Freeman, the most recent chronicler of the history of the Lippincott firm. I was excited then when in 2005, I inquired at the HSP and discovered that it had received a gift of archival material from the firm several years earlier. At that time, I had no extent, idea of the extent or the condition of the gift, but the general sense of no survival did not really lead me to have much hope for it. You can imagine my delight when a year or so later I was to discover that it was extensive, but unprocessed, housed in 94 boxes with an initial set 50 feet of printed volumes. And here now is, yes, these are pictures of the current. The bulk of the collection consists of pressed letter books recording the firm's outgoing correspondence, but uh, many of them suffered from water damage, presumably from that fire, and mold, and they were badly in need of attention. Uh, in 2007, I was able to make a full inventory of the archives and prepare the draft of the finding aid, but Sarah Nash, with the help of our sponsors, uh, has now revised and expanded it, as well as seeing the treatment and rehousing of all the material. But let me go back and give some history of the firm. No, there. There's our man, Joshua Ballinger Lippincott. He was born in Juliustown, Burlington County, New Jersey, in March of 1813. As a teenager, Lippincott entered the book trade as an employee of David Clark, bookbinder and bookseller, whose stand was on in Philadelphia on 4th Street. About 1831, Clark's business failed, and Lippincott, who was 18 years at the time, was put in charge of the business at the request of its creditors. Lippincott established himself in business as J.B. Lippincott Booksellers and Stationers in 1837. And over the following decade, the firm began to publish some books, including Bibles and religious texts. But in late 1849, Lippincott purchased the extensive book jobbing and stationery business of a firm called Grigg Elliott and Company. And I saw that we had a question about that. Grigg Elliott and Company traced its heritage back to the 1790s, Benjamin and Warner. And because of that, and the fact that Lippincott sort of encompassed Grigg Elliott and Company, they often think of themselves as dating back into the 18th century. But after purchasing Grigg Elliott in 1849, Lippincott went on to build probably the most extensive publishing, importing and retailing, wholesale and manufacturing business in the United States. Uh, in 1863, the firm moved to Market Street, the 700 block on Market Street, and by 1871 had built and occupied two large connected buildings that stretched back to Filbert Street. And you won't be able to see, but this image is continually fascinating because, because you can see all of the various activities that Lippincott took care of from, from retail book selling to 
printing, job printing of invitations and things like that, not to mention their regular publishing and jobbing business. Um, these buildings, next slide please, were gutted by fire on the final day of November, 1899. And by August, 1901, had the firm had moved into a new building in Washington Square. I think we saw a picture of that earlier. It still stands in his uh, um, condominiums where it remained in, until it removed to 1999 when it removed to its current offices in the Penn Mutual Building. By 1885, the firm was incorporated as a private company. Lippincott had already opened a branch office in New York City in 1871 and another in London in 1875. Further branch offices were established in Montreal, which moved to Toronto in 1966, and in 1918 in Chicago. The company went public in 1972 and was acquired in 1978 by Harper and Rowe. In 1990, the company was acquired by Walters Kluwer, who merged it with Raven Publishers, and then in 1998 with Wilkins, Williams and Wilkins to form the present Lippincott, Williams and Wilkins. And as we saw, it continues to publish many types of medical what books and other things under the Lippincott name. But to return to the archives, the Lippincott archives are a major resource documenting the history of the American book trade and publishing activity. To a large extent, they remain unexamined and underutilized by scholars but that will now change. At this point, it is impossible to know what useful insights they might pry, pr provide into our publishing history. But in conclusion, I wanted to give a hint by looking at a single set of records, those that relate to the firm's London agency established in 1875 and only closed in 1955, 80 years later. The archives include, from the beginning, outgoing correspondence, and this is the cover of the very first bound volume of copies of the outgoing letters. And for the years 1890 to 1936, everything received from the London office. And these were originally housed in scrapbooks, but um, have now been archivally disbound and put into folders. And they're fascinating. I mean, it's not only correspondence, but it's flyers, it's receipts, it's everything how rich this material is for the study of the transatlantic trade in books is only hinted at by the very first letter to survive. It is a letter from Philadelphia to the newly hired London agent, Joseph Gamerson, explaining what sorts of works the firm was hoping him to acquire. And I'm going to just read parts of this letter. You are aware that our business is general, our publications covering all classes of literature. This renders us able to handle any, and underlined, good book that we can secure. And we feel that we've lost a number of valuable ventures lately by not having someone in London to look after them properly. Being on the ground, you can ascertain in advance when an important book is passing through the press. 
and communicate with us respecting the purchase of an edition of the same or the early sheets. There are constantly appearing books by unknown authors yet possessing merits which are soon to be discovered. To secure these works is a special object with us. And we want you to watch the reviews. And when there appears to be a unanimity in the promise of a book among the reliable periodicals, we would like you to mail us a copy for the purpose of reprinting. This applies especially to novels. Of great interest, he next goes on by discussing how things were managed given that there was at the time no international copyright for foreign works in the United States. And I'll quote one last paragraph and then I'll hand off to Justina. Of great interest, uh, he, with respect to the so-called and he quote, adequate etiquette of the trade, in the absence of international copyright, there is no legal protection in the republication of foreign books in this country. And as a matter of policies, the publishers have ag mutually agreed that the foreign works announced in an acknowledged medium, the New York Commercial Advertiser, shall have the undisturbed right to this pub market. As an after consideration, it is also agreed that the publishers who introduced an author to our public shall have the right to consequent pub productions of that author if he publishes without delay. And here you have it in this single letter, a sort of picture of Lippincott's what trade goals and how its aspirations for foreign works and how it was negotiating the tricky business of publishing books that were not covered by copyright. And I just offer this as a, a slight sort of glimpse into the richness of this archive. But I know I need to pass on to Justina and so thank you. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that. And I think that brings all of us um, who are work with Walters Kluwer today or are HSP members and interested generally, brings us up to speed um, of this long, vast history and issues that have been uh, percolating throughout that industry's history. Again, I can really not emphasize enough how significant this archive is for scholars, writers, historians, anyone who is interested in understanding the development over the past 200 years of how we learn and share information and compile that information into books, magazines. Um, the J.B. Lippincott Company became successful, as you said, at that over 100 years ago uh, in their trade publications uh, with Lippincott's monthly magazine, the works of names like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Rudyard Kipling and Oscar Wilde all appeared in the magazine. And you can see here um, the uh, publication of The Sign of the Four, Doyle's second Sherlock Holmes story in uh, the monthly magazine <clears throat> in 1890. Uh, and as Michael has just said, um, they were involved, Lippincott was involved in everything from printing to distributing and retail, in addition to the editorial work that they were doing. And so before we bring this conversation back to the present, I wanna just share a few of these visual gems that are in this collection, the series of original artworks from the trade publications, as well as then the medical publications. Uh, here you see in the stories, uh, stories all children love was a series that J.B. Lippincott published. Um, they published Heidi by Johanna Spiri, the story of an orphan girl living with her grandfather in the Swiss, Swiss Alps, first published in 1881 in German, and then the Lippincott version in 1915, translated in the book um, by a woman named Elizabeth Stork, who, according to the foreword by, uh, by her English professor husband, Charles Wharton Stork, was well equipped to provide this translation of this uh, story because she was born in Austria. And they, she, they had a daughter Heidi's age who liked to dress in Tyrolese dress. 
Um, and in fact, the, the dress and the setting details of Heidi are such a delight in these watercolors. These characteristics emerge in the illustrations executed by artist Maria Louise Kirk. Um, Maria Louise Kirk enjoyed a prolific career as a children's book illustrator, illustrator after extensive training, the School of Design for Women and at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, both here in Philadelphia, and also at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, in addition to Heidi, here you see she illustrated Lippincott's 1916 publication of Pinocchio. And so here I'm showing you the slide of Candlewick and Pinocchio when they get their uh, donkey ears. Kirk illustrated many other titles and we have other original watercolors for those publications in uh, for that series, uh, Stories All Children Love. And so there's extensive correspondence in the collection uh, from Lippincott's art director of 40 years, Edward Holloway, um, in the records of the publication department as well as the manufacturing department. And so again, the invitation is here for us all to better understand these relationships between artists and publishing. And so because of their business acumen in, and creative success in the trade publishing, Lippincott was able to continue into the 20th century and establish a base of medical publishing um, that continues today as we heard from, from Lisa. And so in the early years, medical publishing was an important element of Lippincott. In 1878, the firm published a handbook of nursing, the first commercially published nursing handbook in the United States. These works came to predominate the business in the, in the 1900s. And the collection housed at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania contains over 120 original medical illustrations used in a number of publications, including the one I have on the screen, Dr. George Pearsall's Human Anatomy, at least I mentioned it earlier, published first in 1907. Um, what I love about this is that uh, it, 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 the title page talks about a little bit about that process. Lisa again alluded to it, that this publication has 1,734 illustrations, 1,522 are original and largely from dissections. So a curiosity for me as I was looking at this was how did these, um, how did these artists actually work and uh, work alongside these uh, dissections. So the, the objects that are in the collection feature this artist family, first Herman Faber, and then his sons Ludwig and, uh, and Irwin. Here you see a uh, signature on one of the original artworks of Herman. This serves as the frontispiece to Pearsall's work. And again, these are large, you know, 36 by 20 inch um, original watercolors. And then his son Ludwig, whose signature you see here with the dated uh, in 1907, um, also predominates this collection. And then the, the other brother, Irwin, translated what his brother and father had done into the black and white prints that were then used for publication. Um, so let me just share a few more slides of these really uh, really fun, interesting medical illustrations. Um, Herman Faber was uh, a portrait artist as well as an illustrator, fun or not so fun fact. He had served on the staff of the Surgeon General during the Civil War, and he made a sketch of President Lincoln on his deathbed and the room in which Lincoln had died. Um, these illustrations have all of these handwritten notes, and I'm so curious about the process these prints went through from creation to publication. Uh, Herman's work, the father, tends to be less defined and kind of in a sketchier state. Um, this one, I cannot absolutely attribute it to one of the plates in the book, Human Anatomy. Nerves and other little anatomical features are written out. And again, I'm just extending an invitation to all of you who work in medical publishing to come and look at these and really see how they're describing um, uh, what we see in the illustration. Uh, there are corrections to some of them, things like apply crayons to both or some other notes that seem to be a communication between um, artist and an editor. And then this is a work from the son Ludwig. The works that are signed by Ludwig tend to have sharper outlines. They're more vibrantly colored. Some of them have his signature in blue 
Um, this one is in, in regular gray and some editorial notes like the previous one. And they do closely relate to uh, plates that are in human in the, in the, in the publication, human anatomy. Here's one of the, one of the signature features. Um, this one does not include any notes surrounding it. So again, I'm curious, it, was this a later edition after corrections had been made? And this one will then go to the next um, step in the process where it's made into a print uh, or has this one just been overlooked and didn't receive any, any corrections from the editors? And I also wanna point out on this one, the staining that you see sort of on the edges of the, the paper, Michael alluded to it, but the recently completed project uh, included extensive conservation work to clean and stabilize uh, part of this collection. And then just again, I wanna share a few interesting ones that show the sort of process of dissections where you have the abdominal cavity and then you have some of it removed to sort of topographically um, relate to what, uh, what the publication needed to display. And again, these artworks really testify to that materiality of the dissections. There's hooks, there's chains, sort of where some of the tissue is being pulled back. And in the final publication, those hooks and chains do remain in the publication. Again, uh, this is just a brief look at a fraction of the original artworks that came in. And there is all kinds of questions for me about the process. These Faber uh, family of artists sitting in the dissection room and sketching, receiving feedback from editorial doctors and revising. Uh, and then as they move on to publication, uh, to human and into the, into the publication of human anatomy over a hundred years ago. So now I wanna bring this back into the present day and invite uh, Chidi Berry eBay to come back onto the screen and uh, talk to us about his work as an illustrator and some of the work he's been doing. Chidi Berry, are you here? Yes, hi everyone. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen. And, uh... This all takes a moment as we switch from speaker to speaker. Yep. All right. Thank you. That looks uh, great. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for having me. I'm Chidi Eberi Ibe, because a lot of person don't know how to pronounce the name. So um, I, a little about me, I did a first degree in chemistry. Um, while still um, doing a first degree, I was um, teaching myself how to draw uh, with pen and pencil, mostly focused on drawing African children. And uh, until I applied to medical school in the Ukraine, we shortly got the crisis. I couldn't continue. And for me, um, illustration has become um, a passion, has become, a, a, for me, a purpose, because I understand that there is so much to do about, there's so much to talk about illustration, there's so much we can address in the system through medical illustrations. And I will just, I'll be showing um, my artworks and some of the work steps I, I take to not achieving that. So um, for me, most of people who actually know my work would understand that my works are actually focused on representation, showing the dark skinned people, right? And um, so, from the image on the slide, just shows that just 4.5% of images show black people in general medical textbook. And it's amazing to see um, um, beautiful, beautiful illustrations that, that were done by amazing illustrators and how, how they are done that. It's really amazing. It's really amazing. And um, I mean, those, those, those are our fathers in illustration who had given us, who had paved the way for us to, to learn and to be, to be here right now. So, but for me as a young person, my focus is on representation of black people and talking about creating medical illustration focused on black people and, 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 and people of color generally. This image, which you see on the screen was, um, viral last year, simply because a lot of persons haven't really seen much about um, much of black illustrations, much of diverse images like this. And a lot of persons said a couple of things are like, why do images like this matter? And some said anatomy is anatomy, right? That, that there is no point to represent them differently. And um, well, I, I would say that there is a need to represent these images differently. And, uh, and, 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 and that's why, um, that's why I do what I do because I understand that that um, typically people haven't really understood that there has been a lot of um, approach to us. I mean, for me, that in the healthcare space with a medical student and also an illustrator, I understand that there is so much lack of representation 
and in, in, in medical literature where in, in general medical tests with just 4.5 percent of images are black people and this image just shows me walking creating an illustration and um and that's me doing a ted talk that was just um last month so um this is a picture showing a covid tool of of how the symptoms represent differently on skin colorations and and for me this is one of the most important things to understand why creating diverse medical illustrations are important because um, as skin tone varies, so are the signs and symptoms in variation. So this is a picture of a work step of my illustration. So um, this, this was the second image I created when I started making illustrations, when I started teaching myself illustrations. That was, this was I did this image in, in 2020. So on the far left, um, we just see a basic sketch of, of a model. Then after creating that, the one of the middle shows adding the muscles, overlaying the muscles um, on, on the model. Then the final one shows the total sketch. You know, trying to make it more realistic. So I did this particular with I did this with um, Adobe Illustrator, which is the tool I used to learning. And um, so this is actually the work step for me. For typically, um, typically, what I do first um, for creating an illustration is to um, find a subject matter that's relative to me, that, that actually um, list that is really, really um, not represented much, right? Make a lot of research about it. And what I do first is to create a model and to build a sketch around it. Like um, you can see on this image on the far left, showing just a 2D illustration of, of a mother, like showing a, a, a section of the mother breastfeeding um, her child and for me illustrations are more of um, communicating in as much as I, I try to get the anatomy correct communicating emotions and telling stories through them because I feel that's where uh, people resonate more because if we are building illustrations that are more um, uh, relative to medical students because the essence of creating images like these is for studies is for reference purposes and for me i try to create images as a medical student that can resonate that are very relative to medical students for example if a child or if a student sees images like this showing how i mean the anatomy and showing how a mother is breastfeeding her child this is quite more uh, relative and it's it, it, i mean you, you, you when reading the anatomy which is quite bulky you know you find it more interesting to quite more, more interacting and um you, you tend to retain more for me i think most times when I draw more, I tend to retain more information than when I study more. So this is actually um, the, the importance of creating images like this. So this is actually the work step to creating these images um, that I do. So for this particular image, which I created on sickle cell disease, I mean, which is a striking number, which I, I wrote it that more than 300,000 babies in, are born with sickle cell disease in Africa every year. But strikingly, there's little number of representation. So I'm going to show how I, I created this image. These images actually are created into layers. Each of these images are broken down into layers. The cells, the and red blood cells, the the leg also which shows here. Everything is actually broken down into layers. So this is a video of my workspace. I use Photoshop now to create my illustration. So I'm going to play this video right now and showing um, that each of these images are separate in entire layer. So as you can see, I'm actually moving each of these layers apart um, because when we're creating images like because when when the image that that um that justine had shown earlier on which was created in in watercolors it's difficult to make corrections if there are errors in images like that and thanks to technology that brought graphic tablet to us right now they're able to do illustrations and do proper corrections to them so it's important that images like this are created in, in layers for for easy um corrections or for animations of course this can be done so this is actually a, the work step to creating the last image which you saw. And um, same thing, what I do is first is to create a basic out sketch of the image, then take it into form and create a form out of it. This is on vitiligo, um, which is still on representation of black people. For me, that is a medical student and focus on creating black images and trying to um, create healthcare equity through diverse images. My goal to doing this is to building proper representation as a medical illustrator, trying to focus the illustrations and trying to bring too much awareness to the black community. And I mean, there's so much that has been done recently. A lot of illustrators are working assiduously 
in doing the images, um, anatomical illustrations, and I think there's still more to be done, you know, in areas of medical illustrations. And thank you so much for having me. Today. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And you can end your screen share. I think we have a few minutes um, before we wrap up, but I just, and don't go off screen and everyone can actually come back on screen if you want to. Um, my question for you though, as we're looking at, at the work that you do is thinking about who your audience is. I mean, that breastfeeding um, image is so powerful in normalizing breastfeeding. And it's, it's distinctly different than um, the images I was showing that were for a human anatomy publication 100 years ago. Who do you see as the audience for the work that you do? Is it doctor's offices? Is it um, education that is going out to people generally? Um, is it healthcare providers? Is it healthcare receivers? Tell me a little bit about who you're thinking about when you're creating those images. Yes, um, first of all, I my audience are actually healthcare providers because um, in as much um, as we are training medical students to be healthcare providers in the future and exposing them to diverse images like this. It's also important that the healthcare providers are exposed to images like this. For example, uh, um, a, a, a mother shared an experience with me and said that um, she had skin ulcer and she walked into the hospital. I mean, she's black and she said, and the her dermatologist told her that black people don't have skin ulcer. And she came out feeling denigrated feeling bad, feeling sad. And that's because the healthcare provider had no prior exposure to images like this, to diverse images like this, or to diagnosing skin conditions that, that are not white. You know, so the approach to this is to focus on the healthcare providers and also medical students in training, because if medical students are being trained and are going to come out to become doctors, I think the foundation is through education, through exposing them to this proper, proper representation so they could have the technical know-how in, in offering quality healthcare services to the community. Cool. Yeah, I think one of the things that struck me, and, and, and Lisa, I might kick this to you too, was a phrase Michael used from his quote about being on the ground, you know, so they established this London office and you know things out there. Um, and I, I think what I'm getting through all of this is the sort of global network you know, really sort of developing um, collaborations in different parts of the world, whether that's formal business relationships, but sort of also hearing like what is going on on the ground. And I, I wanna invite Lisa, if you wanna talk a little bit about how Walters Kluwer does that too, thinking about some of the issues T.D. Barry is, is bringing up. Yes, uh, we are um, well along the path of making sure that all of our content is inclusive. Um, we're also very concerned with um, equity and being sure that all people have access to the best information. The selection of artwork is quite carefully curated um, to be sure that we represent all, all of our customer, all of our patients, because we are a global publisher. So we include um, diverse skin tones as often as we possibly can. And as a global company, I'm assuming you have people throughout the, the world who make those connections. Like yes. that's, again, um, that's bringing it back to Lippincott and what they were doing with London, <laughs> Michael's yes, talk. Yeah, we have right. a team in, in Mexico City. Um, we have, uh, I work with people in Spain and Australia and Asia. We have offices around the globe. And Chidi Barry, can you tell us a little bit about your collaborations that you, I mean, I read a whole bunch of different organizations in your um, intro and you just, we put in the chat a TED talk that you just gave. Can you talk a little bit about how important collaboration is in your work? Yes, I think collaboration is a key thing. It's quite very important. And for me that has, um, that I've created a niche for myself and um, and um, still trying to put the work out there. I think collaboration would be, um, is the integral thing to addressing this and to, sh to show much of my work. For me, currently, I'm, I'm working with a lot of organizations, like I'm working with, um, with the with AMA, which is the Association of Medical, American Medical Association in the US, working with, the, uh, with WebMD, working with Harvard Medical School, because I think those are the big, the big names. I'm going to work with Elsevier, which is one of the big you know, medical publishers, medical publishers, you know, 
So I, I think those are um, those are the big names in, in medical pub, uh, publications. And having collaborations like that with my expertise, with my skill, uh, would be a way to normalizing the use of these images, right? Because I, I, I would say in my little space, I've done my possible best, you know, to put the work out there. And that is, I mean, it's, 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 it's a platform there right now to promoting the work. And I think collaboration is actually the key to making the work out there. Thank you. Um, it's just two o'clock now. And I think that making our little space, doing the best we can in our little space uh, is a great way to end because I think each of us today has like taken the story of Lippincott and brought it to you know, the, the current conversations um, in our work that we do today. So thank you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Michael, for thank all you. of your work. Chidi Berry, thank you for joining us as well from across the ocean. And we wish you the best of luck in your studies. Um, may you be safe and, and successful in all of this. And again, just a final thank you uh, for joining us today for Friends to Walters Kluwer, the support you've given us in getting this collection out to uh, processed and an in, in invitation in to come research it here at 13th and Locust in uh, Philadelphia. The library is open. You can pull items. You can look at those medical illustrations if you want to. We have them on display right now. They will be up through tomorrow physically on display. And then we will be launching um, the same in a website that you uh, will include in the follow-up email. So you'll be able to look, even if you live in Los Angeles or Atlanta, you'll be able to take a closer look at some of those uh, Faber artist drawings. Thank you to our HSP members. Without you, we could not be offering programs like this. Um, keep in touch with us. If you want to join our newsletter, it's hsp.org slash enews. And I want to just, again, say thank you. Everybody can come back on screen and do a good Good, good, goodbye. Hi, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for your kind comments, too. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a great afternoon, everyone.